you, Lord. I was, uh, there's a verse that the Lord quickened to me in uh, Psalm 105. And uh, thank you, Lord. And uh, this is a, we're not, this, we might come back to this later, but I wanted to read this to you because in Psalm 105, and um, verse 37, I believe, that's, that's not the right, the verse. Let me see if I can find this. Well, I believe it's in Psalm 105 somewhere, but it said that the Lord sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from their destructions. You can look that up. It's, I believe it's in Psalm 105, but I could be mistaken there. But he sent his word and healed them and did what? And delivered. delivered them from their destruction. You look up the word destruction, it means pit. What is, which one is it? 107. 107. What verse is that? 20. Yeah, that's it. Psalm 107, verse 20. You scripture experts, you. Um, it says in verse 20, He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Now, how did He heal them? He sent His what? And then how did He deliver them? With His word. Those two are connected. Healed them with His word and sent, them, sent His word and delivered them. And I say that because a lot of times when people are struggling, they don't make the connection between revelations of God, revelation of God's Word and getting free. And a lot of Christians will live from crisis to crisis. And they have a problem and then they, they want prayer. And, and prayer's good. If you, if you, come get prayer. But sometimes the answer to your, God, God, to your prayer is not that God delivers you, but that He sends you His Word. And that would deliver you if you yielded to it, if you believed it, and if you said yes to it. It's like people that pray, pray to God, Lord, I'm struggling financially. I don't know what I'm going to do. We're tight, we're tight. And, and God says, you need to tithe. Did God just deliver you? And, and people just, they don't, they, they just want his part. <laughs> you know, just drop it on my front porch. Right. He sends his word. It's the truth that makes you free, free Right. And sometimes people's answers come in and it, it hits them in the forehead and they don't recognize it and they don't go home and pray for an answer. Well, you just got your answer. And now, now it's your time, your part to get involved in that and obey, right? He sent his word and he healed them and did what? And delivered them. And the word destruction there means out of the pit. Ever been, felt like you've been in a pit? Yeah. A dark place? And how would God get... I just, <laughs> I, can't, I don't have time to talk about this day, but so many times in my life, God would send a word. And through his word, he would deliver me. And who's, it's he, it's he's doing the delivering, but the word is always, always, almost often, all the time, the avenue that, that, that comes. And sometimes when you pray, he'll show you what to do to get out of the pit. Not just pull you out of the pit, because if he pulls you out of the pit, like watch this. Okay, so you need money, but you don't tithe, and you don't give, and you don't sow. And so you pray, and God gives you money. You know where you're going to be back six months from now? Sure. I, no, I'm not, now listen, this isn't, I'm not interested in pulling money out of your pocket. I don't care about your money, and God doesn't need your money. But if you don't sow your money and tithe, it'll keep God from doing what he wants to do in your life. Amen. Somebody said, all those preachers want is my money. Well, maybe. Maybe there are some bad preachers that just want your money. But maybe there are some genuine preachers that want to see you prosper and increase. <laughs> Somebody said, man, it takes guts to talk about finances in church. It don't take guts. It's the word. Amen. You either want it or you don't. And, and, and that's up to you. If you don't want it and you don't think that that's important, then you'll struggle through life. And you will not come up. And you will not be the blessing you could be. And you'll not have what you, what you should have. And you might get to heaven. And, and, and you know, the, why am I talking about this? <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Uh, it says Jesus is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And in heaven, he's that high priest. The only thing Melchizedek did in the scripture is took Abraham's tithe. That's the only thing that you see Melchizedek, one of the main things you see him do, is he took the tithe. And he says, Jesus is the high priest forever. After, for, say forever. forever. <laughs> after the order of Melchizedek. And how long is he the high priest after the order of Melchizedek? Forever. forever. So if you don't tithe here and get it here, you know where you're going to get it? When you get there. Because it's forever. 
And you will tithe there too. We see tithing in the beginning, don't we? Don't touch the tree. Don't eat the tree. That's mine. That's, that's a principle of tithing. It was there in the beginning. It's there now. And it will be there when you, when you get to heaven. But it's not because God's trying to get something from you. Because he's trying to get something to you. That's right. We give his gift. right? And, you have to, and you have to recognize that his word is my answer. And he sent his word to deliver me. Now, if I say no to the word, then you just said no to the deliverance. And a lot of times people don't want to do anything. They just want to pray something. But Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then ask what you will and it shall be done. And I, and I think that just we need to remind ourselves of that because prayer is vital. It has a vital role. It's one of the most important things that we have as believers. But it's not something you use so that you don't have to do what God told you to do. So I'm just going to pray and ignore you and just see if you'll do it anyway. That's not how it works. Sometimes your answer is for you to make a change. Not for him to do something, but for you to make a change so he can do something. Everybody okay this morning? Okay. What verse do I have yet? 1 Thessalonians 5. Thank you, Lord. He sent his word and delivered them from the pit. Healed them and delivered them from the pit. Anybody ever could, could testify this morning and say, you know, I've experienced that. He sent his word in my life. And I was, I was struggling, I was, but, he, but he sent his word, and I believe that word, and I receive that word, and I put that word into practice, and, and I'm not in the same pit I was years back. I got delivered from that, that pit. And if you're in a pit today, you'd get delivered the same way. Now, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, I've started some uh, teachings a, couple, a month back or so, um, a little series entitled All the Way. Can you say All the Way? And um, this, uh, we, we were, this has been about five weeks since the last time we talked about this. So one thing that, that I wanted to do when we pray right here before we get into this is when, you, when we, we were on something, we were, did it for two weeks, then we had a week off, and then I came back and pastors were out of town, we did it again. So three out of four weeks we were ministering on this. And when you're on it in a week after week like that, you get to a certain place. And because you get to this place, then you can go to the next place. But it took us three weeks just to get to that place. And be, it's hard to just go now from here back to where we were. So we need to ask the Lord to help us, and we're going to do that right now, help us to get our hearts back to the place they were a few weeks back so that we can go further in this today. And he could do that, right? He could bring that right back up and get us right to that place so that we can go, go further into this because there's some more things that he wants to, to reveal to us about this. So let's, let's pray today. Father, we thank you today, Lord. We ask you in particular to bring our hearts back up to the place where they were a few weeks back when you administered these teachings to us. Lord, you had showed some things to us. You had revealed some things to us that blessed us and helped us. And we're asking you by your spirit that you would get us back to that place so that we could go further in this today. And we thank you for revelation of your word. And Father, I thank you for grace and help today to minister your word just the way you'd have me to in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and this is one of the, the foundation texts. Do anybody remember any of these teachings that we talked about all the way? Raise your hand if you just, if you, okay, a couple, yeah, a lot of you in here. Yeah, and uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is what was our foundation text in this, and we're going to just look at verse 23 today. And it said, And the very God of peace sanctify you, holy, I pray your whole spirit, your whole soul, and your whole body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus. The very God of peace sanctify you. Holy, your whole spirit, your whole soul, your whole body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this, this phrase God uses to describe himself. Now who's writing this? Somebody said Paul's writing this. I understand Paul's writing it, but the, the, the pen is the spirit of God. So this is God, I got, Lauren's not back there, I was pointing up to the screen and you were all looking up there going, what are you pointing to? Um, the, the pen is the Holy Spirit, and, and so God is, saying, is telling you that he himself, this is who I am, I am the God of what? Peace. Peace. Now, a lot of times things can get lost in translation, and what a word means to us, it doesn't mean to somebody that speaks a different language. When you and I hear peace, I, I would assume that a lot of us think about a state of tranquility, a calmness, 
the, the opposite of chaotic is peaceful, right? And certainly that's part of what this means. But Hebrew people, they translate this word peace as shalom. And in, in the Greek, it's, I think, urine is how you say that in the Greek. And it's the same idea of shalom. And when you look it up, it's not referring to just a lack of chaos. That's part of it. But it starts to refer to, you start looking up and, and you'll find words like prosperity, security, safety, soundness. Soundness is, is referring to wholeness. You'll find health, the word health, healing, peace healing. You'll find wealth, health and, and wealth. Man, a lot of people are against that, but that's what the word means. Health and wealth and security and safety and prosperity and soundness. Hebrew scholar one said in a, it was a textbook that uh, teaching the beginnings or the elementary things of the Hebrew language, and this is the first thing that they teach people is shalom, because that's how Hebrews, Jewish people, that's how you greet one another, shalom. And it's the way that they greet one another, and it means all those things. And in that book, they said the best way to describe shalom is nothing missing, nothing broken. Nothing. Isn't that good news? And God is the God of what? Peace. So when, when you hear peace, don't just think lack of chaos. Become Hebrew. When you hear God of peace, security, safety, prosperity, wholeness, wellness, nothing missing, nothing broken, God of peace. Right? Right? And he referred to himself, let's see, one, two, three, four, five different times in the New Testament as the God of peace. And we won't read all those. But um, many, multiple times he referred to himself as that. Is he trying to get something across to you and me? So if he's a God of peace, then he's a God of prosperity. He's a God of health. He's, why do you think Jesus bore your sicknesses and carried your diseases? Because he's the perfect representation of the Father in the earth. You know, if you look at the cross, you'll get to know everything about God you need to know because that reveals to him. One of his names in the Old Testament is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. Is he a God of health and a God of wealth and prosperity? He told Joshua, if you meditate my word day and night, you'll make your way prosperous, <laughs> right? Because that's who he is. And this God of peace is the God that you and I serve. Um, Psalm 35, 27, you don't have to go there, but it said that, that God takes pleasure in the prosperity. That's the same word peace or shalom. So the God of peace takes pleasure in the prosperity or the shalom of his people. He delights in it. When you and I prosper, when you and I are walking healthy and wealthy and strong and protected and blessed, he that's what he delights in. So he said, I don't like that. Well, you need a revelation. <laughs> Because God likes it. This is who he is. And uh, we told you early on in this teaching that when, he, when the, his people left Egypt, remember he delivered them out of bondage and they were exiting Egypt. You remember in Psalm 105, that's the verse I was referring to earlier, Psalm 105, 37 talked about that he le they left with the silver and gold. Well, that's prosperity and wealth, isn't it? And then it said there was none feeble among them. <laughs> and that's health, right? And who did that? Who, who's doing this? Who, who delivered them out of Egypt? And why did, why did he deliver them in that manner? I mean, why do you have to leave with the money? Why do you have to leave all healed? Because that's what he likes. Because he's the God of what? The God of peace. How about for you and me? Do we, is he the same today? Yes. He hasn't changed. And, and the scriptures talk about he led them out of Egypt. So what if some people decided they wanted to stay? Then would they miss out on the stuff God was trying to get them into. So if they decided they wanted to stay in Egypt, then they shouldn't complain if they're sick and broke because they could have followed God and had the silver and the gold and been healed. The God of peace. This is the God that we, you and I serve. Um, go with me to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. The God of peace. And what did it say that he wanted you to do? I, I jumped out a little ahead, but you can go ahead and go to Psalm 46. It said he wanted to, the God of peace wanted to sanctify you. Holy. Holy is referring to in all respects, God wants you sanctified. Sanctified is a setting apart. Um, it's, a, it's a separation. And God wants to sanctify you. He wants you set apart. You, sanctify also means to make you holy. To be holy is to be uncommon. There's none like 
you. So uh, when we talk about God being holy, he's so pure, so righteous, none like him. And, and part of being sanctified is being made holy, none like you. You know, when God, when, when, when somebody, if somebody were to look into the earth and see believers, they should say, there's none like them with the creator of heaven and earth living on the inside of them. You and I are holy in that respect, are we not? We're, we should not be common. We should not be ordinary. We should be set apart. And how many of you know God does not want you looking like the world in any way? He doesn't want you living like the world, thinking like the world. He doesn't want you living like that. He wants to set you apart so that you and I are what? Different. That we talk different and we think different and we act different and we live different. Is this part of this sanctification? And Jesus said in John 17, 17, Lord, sanctify them through your word. Your word is truth. So we're back to the word, aren't we? The word has a sanctifying power. That when you get in the Word and yield to the Word and believe the Word and walk in the Word, it will start to separate you from things God doesn't want in your life. Now, true, in conduct and in character, yes, it'll separate bad conduct and immorality and you know, things like that. It'll separate those things from you. But there's also verses that talk about, we looked at one already, God sent His Word and healed them. And in Proverbs 4, it talked about His Word is health to our flesh. Would the Word, now we see the Word in those scriptures separating you from what? Sickness and disease. And then again, told Joshua, meditate my word day and night and you'll prosper and have success. Now we see the word separating Joshua from poverty and failure. Are you seeing this? And Jesus said that you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. So now we see the word separating you from anything that would hold you in bondage. So, so God doesn't just want you sanctified in the sense of living a holy life. He absolutely does. But there's a separation that goes beyond even, even uh, more than that. That yes, you, you live a holy life, and we do, and we walk in character. And the word, that's one of the things the word does. But you get in the word and start following it where your finances is concerned, and the word will separate you from lack. How many would testify and say, Oh man, we got some, me and Amber got some testimonies just in the past couple of years. Followed the Lord, and there was a sanct, there was a separating from just enough into a, into a little bit more than enough. And if we keep walking with the Lord, He'd take you from a little bit more than enough to a lot more than enough. <laughs> Not getting too many amens. A couple of smiles. Are you okay? Yeah. And you keep following him. And then he'd lead you into an, a lot, lot, lot more than enough. And we see them, him do this in scripture. But, but he's constantly wanting you, the more separated you become from the world, the more you're becoming like him. And that's what you and I should be endeavoring to do. And he said, I want to, the God of peace wants to set you apart. Do you see this now? This God of prosperity and, and safety and security and soundness and health, he wants to take you and set you apart from the world. And separate you from anything that's profane or unholy or wicked or, you know, the curse. He wants to separate you from all that. And who wants to do it? The God of peace. There's a reason why he referred to himself like this in this verse. The God of peace. He wants to sanctify you holy. And then it said he wanted to preserve you blameless. Preserve you blameless. Under the coming of our Lord Jesus. To preserve you blameless means that he wants to take care of you. Preserve to take care, and to tend to you. And this word blameless as the idea of he wants to keep you free from fault or defect. Say fault or defect. Fault. You know, there's some, there's some things in the church today that are getting a, a good name that shouldn't be getting a good name. Like we don't have to do anything because we're under grace. And, there, you know, it's almost like doing stuff now is like a cuss word in church because we're under grace, so we don't have to do anything. And if you tell anybody to do anything in church, sometimes they're like, well, no, that's not grace. And, and th so there's some stuff that people, you know, you take it, it gets misconstrued and gets out of place. And, but this uh, idea of being preserved blameless or being kept, how did I get there, Lord? <laughs> get me back there. Um, he wants to keep you. He wants to preserve you blameless. He wants to take care of you and tend to you. And, and keep you free from fault or defect. That's where we were going. Um, because a lot of people now, they glorify their imperfections. Well, I'm imperfect. I'm, I'm imperfect and you're imperfect and we're all imperfect, but you know, we're just a bunch of imperfect people serving a perfect God and we all have imperfections and we're just imperfect and imperfect and imperfect. You know, Jesus told you to be perfect. God is not, God is not going to tell you not to come to him because you're imperfect. Otherwise, nobody would come right? Everybody can come, but he's not into your imperfections. When you come to him, 
He's going to start getting rid of those imperfections. They're not to be glorified. They're to be getting rid of and put away, right? Come as you are with all your imperfections, but don't stay as you are. You should be changing. You should be coming more like Him. And some people think they can just come as they are forever and, oh, God don't care. He loves me anyway. He does love you anyway, but He doesn't love that imperfection. You, me, or anybody. And you bring those things to Him and follow them. What you're going to find out is He'll cut them off and He'll take care of it. And you don't have to feel guilty or condemned because you have something in your life. That's not what we're saying. But never be okay with it right. when He wants you to get rid of it. Very good. Big difference, right? And He'll cut those things off you and He. And that's what it comes back to when He says He wants to preserve you blameless. He wants to keep you free from fault or defect in your character, in your conduct, in your spirit, in your soul, and where else? In your body, in your life. He wants to preserve you blameless, take care of you, and keep you free from fault or defect. And how long does God want to do this? All the way. Say all the way again. <laughs> when? To the coming of our Lord Jesus. That's all the way. So He wants to do this all the way, and He wants to do it in every way. Spirit, soul, body. Does He want defect in your relationships? Does He want there to be fault in your relationships? Does He want me and Amber to fight five minutes before I get ready to preach? No. Huh? And be in, be in an argument, and, I'm, and me and her in an argument, and I'm up here telling you to walk in love? <laughs> Is that what He wants? No, he, he wants to get rid of all that. And how about in, and, and this verse actually said, in your body. He wants to get rid of all the fault and the defect. Any, any sickness or disease, God wants to get rid of that. That's who He, why? Because He's the God of what? You're getting it. He's the God of peace. He, he wants to get rid of that stuff. And, and, not, and it's not because that he, so he'll love you more. He loves you as much as he's ever going to love you. You don't have to be condemned about having faults or defects in your life. Come to the God of peace, follow him, and let him take care of you and attend to you and, and see to it that you make it all the way, right? Now, have you found uh, Psalm 46? All right. Thank you, Lord. Is the Lord helping us already? Thank you, Father. Does God want to take care of you in your spirit, in your soul, and in your body all the way to the end? Not making it all the way would be dying early, dying wrong, not fulfilling God's plan on your, for your life. You know, some people live 90 years and, and, don't, and are saved and don't fulfill God's plan for their life. Did you know that? Just, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you're going to hear well done. I told you, I think a couple of times ago, you might just hear, well, you made it. <laughs> but, you know, and, and that's okay. That's better than not making it, you know. But it'd be better if you'd have done what you were supposed to do. Amen. And part of making it all the way is running your race, finishing your course, doing what God told you to do, reaching all the people He told you to reach, walking in all the blessings He had for you to walk in, living a full, long, healthy, strong life, and at the end of your days, going to be with Him in that condition. That's making it all the way. Anybody interested in making it all the way? Yeah, yeah we are. And what's the enemy? What will he tell you? That you're not going to make it all the way. That what, you're going to run out? You're not going to have enough? You're not going to be protected? Oh, there's tragedies all over. Now you can't even come to church and feel safe. Anybody ever hear anything like this? And what's he trying to get you to believe? That you won't make it all the way. That God won't take care of you. He won't tend to you. But what did God tell us in that verse? He wants to keep you free from fault and defect all the way to the coming of our Lord Jesus. And would He do it? He would. He would do it. And we'll look at some of, of what we can do to, to see to it that He is able to do those things. Um, one thing the Lord told me this, and then we'll get into what, he, what we have for, for today. The Lord said this to me in this series that through this teaching and through a, a revelation that God will sustain me, Sustain you is the idea that he will take care of you. I'll tell you what, we're, we're just ahead of ourselves a little bit. Go to Isaiah 46. Let me look at a verse there. Isaiah 46. The Lord's helping us. And uh, the, this revelation that God will sustain me, and what that means is he's going to take care of me. He's going to attend to me. And I'm going to make it all the way. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going to do what he's told me to do. I'm going to experience what he has for me to experience. And in a good old age, a good old age, come on, let's expose the devil right now. Let's expose him. Are you ready? How many of you in the room, the devil has told you you're going to die early? Raise your hand. I'm going to kill you. You're going to fall early. You're going to die early. See how common that is? He's such a liar. 
And, and, part, and, and part of this thing that God's sustaining you and taking care of you is seeing to it that you will make it all the way. And with that revelation, this is what the Lord said to me, with that revelation, through this teaching and through this revelation that God will sustain me, people are going to get completely delivered from fear of every kind. Fear of every kind. Through what revelation? Through this revelation. No matter what comes, God's going to take care of me. No matter what I face, no matter what comes against me, no matter what weapon is formed against me, no matter who is against me, no matter what comes, I'm going to make it all the way. God's going to sustain me. He's going to keep me. And you, th when, when that becomes revelation to you, that fear starts to weaken. And you're not afraid to come to church or to go to a movie or afraid of a shooting, you being involved of a shoot. I'm not afraid. No matter what comes, God's going to sustain me. I'm not afraid of a natural disaster. I'm not afraid of a, of a, a nuclear war. Not afraid. Why? Because no matter what comes, I'm going to make it all the way. Not afraid of getting in a car wreck. Not afraid of a sickness or a disease coming on me. Not afraid of going to the doctor. Not af I don't fear cancer. Don't fear, you know, AIDS or whatever it is. I'm going to make it all the way. People in, their, in your families that, you know, maybe there's been cancer in your families. It can stop with you. It can, somebody said, well, it's hereditary. It's in the genes. You have new genes. You have new DNA. You're bone of his bone. Flesh of his flesh. The only way it stays in your family is if you put it in your mouth and let it carry on. You can put something else in your mouth. You can start saying it won't come on me. God's going to sustain me. And not only that, it's not going to come on my kids. It stops right now. You can, and how, how would you be able to say it? Because there's somebody that's going to shield me. <laughs> oh, I get excited about that. <laughs> there's some, there's, they're going to be some, not something, someone standing between the thing that's trying to take me out and me and it's him and the psalm was talking about it in psalm uh one of the psalms 31 is one of them where he talks about talked about a lot of psalms he said lord you're my rock you are my refuge you are my fortress and that might not mean a lot to us today but in those days if you needed a protection you had to run to a cave and underneath a cliff or underneath the cave of that of that rock there was shelter there there was protection and people would hide there and take refuge there because it was protected and, and, and the same word is the fortress is talking about a fortified city that has walls. And, and what the walls are to the city and what the rock is to the person that's hiding underneath it, God's going to be to me. And there could be something coming to kill you and God just stepped in between you and it. And now it can't get on you. And has he done it already? How many would say he's done it already? <laughs> More than once. <laughs> and could he do it in other areas? Could do it in every area of your life not just talking about protection and, and healing could, could, a, could a recession hit the hit the country again and could he just come between you and it he did with isaac didn't he isaac was, became rich in recession and what he's had doing is he's standing <laughs> i love this stuff he's standing in the middle of it but it can't come on him you know why because god was sustaining him and, and you see it in, in Daniel chapter 3 when the, the three Hebrews got thrown in the fire. How can fire not burn people? There's something in between them and the fire. Yeah, and that, and that same God is the one that you and I serve, and He will stay, sustain you and take care of you and protect you and your kids and your family, right? Some parents live in fear. You know, their kids get old and they, and, and they don't want the kid to leave the house and they're so afraid. Oh, every time I leave, I'm afraid that I'm going to get a call that you're not going to make it home. That's because you don't have a revelation of God as the sustainer. Because when you get a revelation that God is going to sustain her, no matter what comes, I'm trusting him to take care of her and to come between it. And when you do that, you'll stop staying up, waiting for him to get home. You'll go to bed and trust him with it. But that's because you believe he's going to take care of her. He'll stand in between it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Isaiah 46, have you found it? We better look at this, and then we'll get on, get on to the uh, next uh, thing the Lord wants to talk to us about. Now, Psalm 46. This is one of my favorites here. Psalm 46, verse 4. I'm sorry, Psalm. Isaiah 46, uh, verse 4. It says, And even to your old age, I am he... And even to gray hairs will I carry you. I have made 
and I will I have made carry you I have made and I will bear even will I carry and deliver you now let me read this to you out of some other translations the NIV says even to your old age and gray hairs I am he who will sustain you I have made you I will carry you I will sustain you and I will rescue you a couple other translations say I will always keep your keep you safe I will be your God throughout your whole life. Yes, and even when your hair is white with age, I made you and I will care for you. How, how long would that be? That would be all the way, right? All the way. And what's he saying? I'm going to be the one that supports you, carries you, bears you. Are you seeing this? Now look at verse 10 because this will bring some light to this. You know, all these verses were written together. And it says, declaring the end from the beginning... And the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now, declaring the end from the beginning, he just declared your end in verse 4. What's your end? He's going to carry me till my hair's white. And beyond that, if you've got white hair right now, he'll carry What's he, the, the message is all the way. He just declared your end from the beginning. And somebody said, No, but he said, Oh, there she is. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I was looking for you earlier. You weren't here. And I looked back and there was no words up there. I didn't know what to do. Um, he said, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Somebody said, no, God's going to do what he wants to do. He just told you what he wanted to do in verse 4. He wants to carry you and support you. And how long does he want to do it? All the way. Now, let's go to Ezekiel 34 and let's get into this part of this today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's say it in faith one time. Now, let's not just say this to repeat it. If you don't mean this or you don't believe it, don't say it. But those of you that do, let's release something. Are you ready? Yep. Say in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. God's going to sustain me. Sustain and I'm going to make it all the way. All the way. <laughs> oh, it's good news, isn't it? Yes. Now, Ezekiel 34. And let's look at a, a piece of this that is really going to help us today. Ezekiel 34. Now, Pastor Ron talked about some of this last week, about Jesus being our good shepherd. And uh, I'm going to jump on some of this here, because uh, this goes right in with what we were talking about uh, last time I, I ministered to you. Part of this making it all the way is that God, you have to get a revelation that God is our good shepherd. And it's the job of the shepherd to see to it that the sheep are taken care of, and to see to it that the sheep make it how far? All the way, all the way right? That's what the good shepherd does. And Jesus is our good shepherd. And he is supposed to take care of his father's sheep, right? And see to it that his father's sheep make it all the way. Do you think Jesus is a good shepherd? Yes. He's not a negligent shepherd. He's not a bad shepherd. He's the best shepherd, a good shepherd. And his job is to take care of you and me. One question we need to ask ourselves is, well, is he taking care of every believer the way that we've described to you this morning? And the answer is no. Well, why isn't he? And that's what we want to look at. There's two reasons, two things that you and I have to do if we want to be sustained by the Lord. Two things. And uh, part of one of those things, we'll talk, I'll tell you in just a second, but part of that is to understand that he's my good shepherd and he wants to sustain me. And he wants to take care of me. But he's not doing this for every believer. He wants to do it for every believer. But we, can, you and I can do things that can hinder him from taking care of us. And I don't want to do that. How about you? I want to do everything I can to see to it that if something comes against me, he's able to come in front of it and be my shield and my support. Um, look, at, look at this in verse, verse 1, Ezekiel 34. Let's read some scripture here. It said, The word of the Lord came to me, saying... Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, I say unto them, thus says the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do not, I'm sorry, that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock. Say feed. feed. Now, when you look at this word feed, it's not just talking about giving them food. That's part of it. But you look it up in the Hebrew and you'll find it means to tend to. To watch, to guard, say guard. guard, to take care of, or to accompany as an assistant and protector. 
So when he said that he, they did, he didn't feed them, he's not just talking about you didn't feed them food. He's talking about you didn't tend to them. You didn't take care of them. You didn't sustain them the way a good shepherd should. And you get revelation right here because what did he say? Shouldn't shepherds feed the flock? They should, shouldn't they? Now, could you put this in there? Well, then shouldn't Jesus take care of you and me? If he's a shepherd, he should. And he is, and he does. And he's doing everything he can to take care of you and me, but he's limited sometimes by you and me and what we will do and won't do. And there's two things that you and I can do that will hinder him from doing what he wants to do. I'm going to talk about one of them right now. It said, you eat the fat, talking to the shepherds, you clothe you with the wool, you kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The, now look, you're going to get revelation. Are you getting revelation already on what a shepherd should do? You can look at what they're not doing and get revelation on what a shepherd should do. He said, the diseased, you've not strengthened. You didn't heal, you didn't take care of, you didn't support. Neither have you healed that which was sick. What's he saying? You're the shepherd. You're supposed to strengthen what's weak. You're supposed to heal what's sick. He went on to say, Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Should the shepherd bind up something that's broken? Yes. If, if a sheep's weak, should he restore him to strength? Mm -hmm. If a sheep's sick, should he get him healed and well? Yes. And then he said this, he said, Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. If a shepherd's sheep gets driven away, should he go after it? These people that are running from the Lord, you know who's going after him? The good shepherd, yes, he is. right? And this is what a shepherd should do. He said, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force or violence and with cruelty or harshness have you ruled them. Should a good shepherd heal and strengthen and bind up? Now, is Jesus a good shepherd? Now, there, this is what God is rebuking these shepherds for not doing these things. And Jesus is the good shepherd. But there's a lot of believers that would, would tell you that sometimes Jesus doesn't heal. Sometimes he doesn't bind up. Sometimes he doesn't, you know, go look for what's lost. Well, then what would he be? You don't even want to say it. He would be with this category. That you didn't heal. You didn't bind up. You didn't restore. Listen, healing's always available. Jesus is always doing it all the time. Now, there are people that haven't received, and let's not focus on that today. There'll be another time maybe to focus on that. Let's focus on you, though, because you're still here. And don't think about somebody who didn't get it or didn't happen. You've got to know this about your master. He heals the sick. This is what it says about the good shepherd. You've got to start there. And if he didn't heal the sick, then he would be what? A bad shepherd. And if he didn't strengthen the weak, he'd be what? A bad shepherd. And if he didn't feed you and take care of you, then he'd be what? A bad shepherd. A bad shepherd. But he's not a bad shepherd. He's a, he's a good shepherd, isn't he? <laughs> good news. Hey, Lauren, put uh, Zechariah chapter 10 up there. And I want to look at... Well, never mind. Hold on. We'll go... Sorry, Lauren. We'll go back there in a second. Let's keep reading. Our good shepherd is endeavoring to do this for every believer all the time. He never stops shepherding the sheep. He's endeavoring to do that verse right there for every believer all the time. And he never stops shepherding the sheep. Now, there's a whole lot of sheep that won't listen. And, and when you won't listen, that's when the shepherd can't do the stuff that, sure. that he needs to do for you. And here's the statement. Here's the first thing you got to do if you want to be taken care of and make it all the way. To make it all the way, you're going to have to follow the good shepherd fully. Amen. This is what you have to do. Anybody interested in making it all the way? then you're going to have to follow the good shepherd if you want to make it all the way. Um, go ahead, Lauren. Let's do put Zechariah 10 up there. Let me show you a verse. Do you have to follow him fully? What if every, what if every believer was following the Lord fully? What would the body of Christ look like? Strong, healed, prosperous, blessed, doing what God called them to do, running their race, finishing their course. Be more people in here today. Why? Because certainly the, the good shepherd was trying to lead people in here that wouldn't come. And now, he, why was he leading them in here? Because he was going to give them an answer so that they could miss some stuff that they need to miss out on and escape some stuff they need to escape from. But now they didn't come in, so they don't have the answer, so they don't escape. Is it the good shepherd's fault? He was trying to lead you away from it. He was trying to lead you into it. 
This is what he does. This is who he is. He's good, isn't he? Amen. And, uh, but let's not cast any stones. Have you ever not listened? <laughs> huh? I, you ever been dumb? Yep. You and me both. <laughs> when, when, when you know you haven't listened, here's the big thing. This is, this is the big, big part of this. When you know you haven't listened, you know what you need to do? You need to repent and not just be sorry for it, but part of your repentance is, I haven't been following you and doing what you told me to do. I'm sorry for that, and now I'm going to follow you. And in the repentance, there's the restoration. But if you won't repent and you won't change, huh? there's a, there's a scripture in Proverbs that talked about that for people that continually harden their neck, there is no remedy. How can there be no remedy? That they won't repent and continue to harden their neck. What do you mean there's no remedy? God's the remedy. I know, but they're ignoring him. They won't repent. And if you know that I haven't followed him or I haven't done what I'm supposed to do, you know what you need to do? You say, Lord, I repent. I got to get back. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you fully because I need your shepherding in my life. Whatever you say is what's best for me. Well, there's a whole lot of us that don't listen sometimes. How about just like that area? And I don't, I'm just going to be led of the Lord because he keeps bringing this up. I don't think about these things before I get here. But how about financially? If you want to get into the fullness of what God has for you financially, what must you do? You must follow him fully. Right? See how quiet? I said financially, and it's just like you could hear a pin drop. <laughs> We're not going to take another offering. Nobody's going to put pressure on you. We're saying this for you because we want you to increase and prosper and, and walk in what God has for you. And he has got good things for you financially, but how would you get into it? You're going to have to follow him. And if he starts dealing with you about, and he, and he probably has or he will or he's doing it right now, you know, you need to start bringing your tenth. That's the good shepherd leading you into prosperity beyond anything you could ask or think. But then there's another voice, like Pastor Ron talked about last week. He said, well, if you do that, you're not going to eat. And there needs to be a voice that rises up in you. I'm going to eat. God's going to take care of me. Amen. And even if I don't eat, I'm bringing my tenth. <laughs> and if we have to sit here with the lights out, I'm going to bring my tenth. Why? Because God's going to take care of me and sustain me. But my point is, I have to follow him if I want to get into what he has for me. And if I'm going to ignore him and push him aside and then try to pray to get something that I should have got from obeying him, that doesn't work. You got to follow. Amen. Come on, look at, don't look at, I'm not going to make you do that. Say this, you got to follow. <laughs> you got to follow him fully if you want to get into what he has for you to get into. You can't pray your way into something that you're being disobedient about. Right. Well, I'm a prayer. I'm just going to pray. You're, what you're doing is not really even praying. It's, 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 a, it's a religious motion. It ain't even do anything. That, it ain't even, and, it, and it's not going to bear any results. Because as long as you're ignoring him, you won't get in there. But to get to where he wants you to go, you've got to follow him fully. You've got to listen. You've got to pay attention. Come on, do you believe it? Yeah. Look what it says in Zechariah 10. Zechariah 10 and verse 2. We'll put that one on the screen. Let me read this to you in Ezekiel 34, and then we'll look at that verse in Zechariah 10. Are you in Ezekiel 34, correct? Let's read this together in verse 5. It says, And they were scattered... Because there was no, there is no shepherd. And they became meat. Meat means they became an object of devouring to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. And he said, my sheep wandered. That means they were gone astray and got into air through all the mountains upon every hill. And yea, my flock was scattered upon the face of the earth and none did search for them. Verse 7, therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Now, what happens when there's no shepherd? You become a prey for the enemy. And the scripture says you become meat. Meat means you could become the object of his devouring. Why? Why are you being devoured? Because there's no shepherd. Now here's the truth. You can have a shepherd, but if you ignore what he says, you're living like you don't have a shepherd. Right. You have one, but you're not experiencing any of the things he's supposed to do for you because you won't listen. So you can be saved and ignore Jesus and be susceptible to the same things that people that are unsaved are susceptible That's to. Right. Because you're supposed to be protected, but the only way you get protected and provided for is if you follow the good shepherd. Uh -huh. And the good shepherd's going to tell you to do some stuff, I'm telling you right now, that you don't want to do. Yeah. And you don't want to follow. But you need to ask yourself, do I want to be devoured? Um, no, that I'm going to follow. Right? Do I want to be eaten up by the enemy? No, so I'm going to follow. 
And I'm going to hit right close to home because this is important. And I'm not trying to get you to come and hear me preach. I don't, I've preached to a few amount of people that doesn't bother me anymore. But for instance, not only do you have a shepherd, then you have under shepherds who are under the shepherd who are doing the same ministry for you. Now I'm saying this, I'm, I'm not standing in the office of pastor here, so I'm not talking about myself. But I am talking about your pastors, our pastors. So they're flowing with the master like this. And things they tell you are designed to protect you and keep you safe. Are you following me? And if he told them to tell you something and you ignore them, you ignored him. And this is what makes Pastor Ron's hair right, maybe. You didn't do what he said for eight months, and now you're in trouble and you come and you want prayer. And he was probably thinking, you know, if you'd have just done what I told you to do eight months ago, we wouldn't be in this place. But, you know, Pastor Ron's so compassionate and so kind. He, he just sits there, and, and that's good. That's probably what he should do. But anyway, do you see what I'm saying? God's working through men, through women, to help you. And then you ignore him and wonder, well, what's all this problem? Because you didn't listen to the shepherd. Oh, that's not the shepherd. That's just Pastor Ron. I follow the good shepherd. Pastor Ron's working for the good shepherd. Yeah. <laughs> and the stuff that he tells you to do, you know, you're going to want to do. Are you following me? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, it, it, and if there is no shepherd, then, then you become, you become a, a, a prey. You're an object to be devoured. Now, and, and, and what's that? I would understand it about the world. I mean, they don't have a shepherd. I mean, they're going to get devoured. But the sad thing is when you have a shepherd, and, it's not, and you shouldn't be devoured, but you are because you won't listen. And the shepherd will tell you simple things that are no big deal. I was getting convicted about some stuff just this morning. The Lord told me to do that. I, you know, you just kind of, oh, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> I know that you, have anybody in here ever done that? Oh, yeah. You're just like, ugh, ugh. And then you just act like he didn't tell you? Now, he's merciful, you understand yeah. what I mean? And he'll give you grace, but there'll come a time yeah. when you're either going to do it or be eaten up, right? Because right? it's one thing to get some mercy. It's another thing to just be unrepentant and not want to change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's when you get in a bad place when you're unwilling right. to do it. Now you're in a bad position. And, uh, but the, the good shepherd, he's going to tell you to do little things that, that you might think, well, that's not that important. But if he's telling you to do it, what do you need to do? And he's going to tell you to do some stuff that, that it ain't real convenient to do. And he's going to maybe send you some places that you don't really want to go <laughs> and cause you to stay there longer than you want to stay. <laughs> but if you want to walk in the fullness of what he has for you, what do you need to do? You need to follow him fully. And this is where, and we, we're not going to talk about this, this is another part, this is where trust comes into play. Because I trust you, so I follow you. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to get it. I might not even want to do it, but I, I trust you, and I know that you know what's best for me. Right? right? And it's little things, like, you know, come and do a service in the middle of the week. You, you, have you ever heard that from up here before? <laughs> so he said, you're going to talk about this again? I don't care about just you being in the seat. You know, I mean, we're on the internet, people are getting it, I mean, you know, I mean, that's not, you know, I'm not just trying to get butts in the seats. You know, I mean, unless this place is fact out and people are lining up outside, it ain't going to be enough for me anyway. <laughs> but my point is that's, some, that's a little bit of direction isn't it so then things that you need for your life they're coming out on those Wednesday nights protection and Sunday mornings I'm, I'm just talking about Wednesday nights but, but things are coming that you need for your life answers that would keep you out that would keep you from needing delivered from the pit because you wouldn't even fall into the pit Got things God would be showing you but if you're not here because you didn't ignore, because you didn't do what the shepherd told you to do. And now you're in a situation where maybe you didn't even have to be in because there was an answer that was given in the middle of February on a Wednesday night, but you didn't want to come because whatever, you know, should you come if the good shepherd's telling you to come? And that's just one instance. It could be getting up and spending time with him in the morning or whatever it is he tells you to do or going to serve. You need to, you know, you need to serve. You, need, you know, when God sent me here, I didn't even know why I was here. I married Amber and thought, I, you know, I know I need to start, stop having services on Sunday morning where I was having them come here. And then I came here and I didn't really want to be here. I'm going to be honest with you. I was just like, what am I doing here? And then weird stuff started happening in the services. And I'm like, this is, and I don't mean weird like unspiritual. I was just, I'm not saying it was wrong. Don't misunderstand me. But my point is I'm saying God sent me here. So I'm not just going to pull out because I get a little upset or don't understand something. Why? Because when you know the Lord sent you somewhere, you know what you do? You stay there. And you'll figure out why he had you there if you stay long enough. And I'm starting to figure some of it out. You know, over the past couple of years, the Lord's been good to me. But my point is, I, you have to follow him. Yeah. 
whether you want to or not, whether you like it or not, whether it looks like it's fun or not, you've got to follow him and do what he tells you to do. And this is how you make it all the way. And don't fall short and don't miss out. Come on, do you have a shepherd? You do, don't you? But if you don't follow him, it's going to be like you don't have one. And you're going to become what? Meat for your adversary. Now this is important because remember in 1 Peter 5, 8, I got some revelation on this. This was, I love this, the Lord gave it to me. Remember it said the enemy seeks whom he may devour. And that word meat is talking about devouring. You know what the enemy's looking for? He's looking for somebody that's away from their shepherd. Because that's who he can devour. And verse 6 started in that chapter, to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And that means submit to him. And to submit to God, you have to submit to the ones that God put over you, which would be the pastors and people God put in your life. And what does the enemy look for? He looks for somebody that, he looks for somebody that thinks they know better than the shepherd. Because then he can devour you. Because you're away from the good shepherd. Right? But you and I, that's not us, right, though? We're going to follow the Lord, right, fully. <laughs> Don't you think when the three Hebrews were sat, sitting in front of the fire of furnace, they were thinking, if we follow the shepherd at this point, we're going to be ashes in a moment. What do they need to do? They need to be quiet and follow. We're not bowing. We're not bowing. We're not bowing. You're, their job is not to protect themselves. Their job is to follow the good shepherd and let the good shepherd protect you, right? Don't you think David was maybe having some second thoughts when he got down there in front of Goliath and thinking, you know, he looked a lot smaller from back there. What's he need to do? He needs to follow the good shepherd, right? And when you do, you can walk in the fullness of what God has for you to walk in. Now, um, let me look, uh, let's keep looking here in uh, the rest of this chapter here. Ze Zechariah, we're still here. Oh, do we got that, Zechariah? Yeah, there it is. Thanks, Lauren. This, this verse speaks to, to the same uh, idea. Just look at the last part. It said, Therefore they went their way as a flock, and they were troubled. And why were they troubled? Because there was no shepherd. The word troubled means they were afflicted, downcast, oppressed, and weak. And why were they troubled? Because there was no... Why were they afflicted? Why, why were they downcast? Why were they oppressed? Because there was no shepherd. Because the shepherd's supposed to take care of you so you don't get in that state. Are you, are you tracking along here? Now, um, keep reading here. In, uh, I'm in Ezekiel now. I think I got you bumbling around, but Ezekiel. And it says in verse 9, Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against the shepherds, and I will require the flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may be meat for them. Are these shepherds losing their place? He's saying, You're not going to do this anymore. I'm taking the people from you. And verse 11 says, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Now search is the idea, it means to take care of. The CEV says, I will look for my sheep and take care of them myself. This is good news. What's God saying? I'm going to look for my sheep and I'm going to take care of them myself. And he goes on here in verse 12. And he says, Thank you, Lord. Verse 12 says, As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep. I will deliver them out of all places. Come on, is this what a shepherd should do? If his sheep does fall in a pit, what should the shepherd do? Pull them out, right? Out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Come on, how many of you know if you're going to make it all the way in this life, you're going to have to be delivered from some dark stuff? Right? And what did he say? He said, I'm going to deliver them I'm going to, out, from a, uh, out of the cloudy and the dark day. Those sheep that are scattered, I'm going to seek them out and I will deliver them. Say deliver them. The shepherd seeks the sheep and delivers them. Now David was a shepherd, wasn't he? He was a, he was a shepherd. He shepherded whose sheep? His father's sheep. And Jesus is a shepherd who's shepherding whose sheep? His father's sheep. Now we don't hear a lot about what David did when he was shepherding his sheep, but he told us of two stories. And when he was talking to Saul right before he was getting ready to go fight Goliath. And he said, I shepherded my father's sheep, and when I did there was a bear and a lion that came and took a sheep, a lamb, out of the flock. And what did he say? He said, I went out after them. 
Now you can read over that and think, yeah, he went out after him. He ran after a bear. You know, if, you, if there's some things you're supposed to do if a bear comes to you and you ever see a bear, you're supposed to like stand still and not look big and, you know, that type of thing. Nobody would tell you, run at the bear. Except the Lord, maybe. <laughs> and he ran out after the bear. And he said, I smote it. He took it by its beard, and he was talking about the lion too, and I, and I cut its head off, and I got the sheep back. Ran after a bear and a lion. This is what the shepherd, David, did with his father's sheep. And Amos, chapter 3, will bring something up here. Put that on the screen, Lauren. Amos, Amos 3, verse 12. Let me show this to you. Amos 3, verse 12. Are you doing okay this morning? Would the Lord deliver you out of a dark place? No matter how far gone you may feel. No matter how deep you're in. You ever felt like I'm in deep? Come on, be honest. Ever felt like, man, this is deep. I'm under it, man. I don't know how I'm ever going to get out of this. I don't know how I'm ever going to get free from this. I don't know. You know who didn't stop trying to help you get out? The good shepherd. And uh, Amos chapter 3, verse 12, look what it says. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes out of the mouth, the lion, two legs, are a piece of the ear. What's he saying? We're just pulling that out now. What's the shepherd do when his lion's in the mouth? He goes into the mouth. Yeah, and wouldn't this be what Jesus would do for you and me? If you felt like you were in the mouth of the enemy and starting to get devoured, would he go into the mouth of the enemy for you and me? And I just told you that to tell you, no matter how deep you're in, no matter how bad it may look, huh? no matter how dark it may seem, if you'll call on the good shepherd and follow him fully, he'll lead you out Amen. and help you. Somebody said, he might lead me out, but I'm going to be in pieces. Well, he can put your pieces back together, yeah. <laughs> right? There's deliverance. This is what the good shepherd does, but what do you have to do? You've got to follow him. You've got to follow him if you want to be delivered. Now, let's close it today, I think, with this. Keep reading. Back in Ezekiel 34. Look what he says in verse 13. And I will bring them out from the people. He's talking about his sheep, right? And I will gather them from the countries. And I will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them upon the mountains of Israel, by the rivers, and in all the inhabited places of the country. Now listen closely now. I will feed them in a good pasture. Good pasture, good is referring to excellent, rich, prosperous, a wealthy place. When, when God leads his people, where does he lead them to? Well, just, that pasture's good enough. Now what's he looking for to lead you into? <laughs> Good, the best, right? Why? Because a good shepherd takes really, really, really good care of his sheep. And the sheep are actually a reflection of the shepherd. So if you see a shepherd and you see sheep behind the shepherd that are dirty and muddy and look like they hadn't ate a meal in three weeks and one of them's got three legs and one of them's eyes all blackened, what does that tell you about the shepherd? Not a good shepherd. But if you look behind the shepherd and you see strong sheep, Healthy sheep, smiling. What do you know about the shepherd? They got a good shepherd. Yeah. And that should be the us because the world should look at you and think, I need to follow, I need to get in that flock. <laughs> he says, I will feed them in a good pasture and, and upon high mountains. High mountains is an elevated place. And Israel shall be their fold. Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie down in a good fold. Fold is talking about your house, where you stay. And what kind of house does God want you to stay in? A good house, and a good there again means excellent, rich, prosperous, the best. Does God want a nice place for you? <laughs> oh, yeah. And they shall lie down in a good fold and in a fat pasture. Say fat pasture. Fat. They used to say that years ago. Oh, man, it's fat. And what it means is fat. You know, it's nice. And this word fat means, that's exactly what it means. It means a rich, robust, are the best part. Now, what am I saying? When you follow the good shepherd, he's not just going to lead you into an okay place. If you follow him fully, he'll lead you into his best for your life. You'll, you'll have, you will sit there and it will be days of heaven on the earth. You look around and go, my, oh my. Look at what the Lord has done. This is marvelous in my eyes. <laughs> How did we get here? He's going to say, you followed me. <laughs> and you better keep following me, otherwise you get out of here. You see what he wants to lead you into? I said, I don't like that. I don't believe in that prosperity stuff. Don't worry about it. You won't be led into it. 
I don't know why people get all upset. They get all upset about praying in tongues and healing and prosperity. You don't have to get upset about it. If you don't want it, God's not going to make you have it. Just go on and don't pray in the Spirit and be poor and sick, and that's fine. That's what you want. I, I'm going to choose something else <laughs> and pray for you because you need a revelation. Now, he said, I will feed the flock. I'll cause them to lie down, says the Lord. I will seek that which is lost and bring them bring the, again that which was driven away. I will bind up that was broken. I will strengthen that which is sick, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. He's talking about these, these uh, shepherds that were bad shepherds. What's God say? I will seek that which is lost. I will bind up. I will restore that which is broken. I will strengthen. I will, I will, I will. And sometimes some of his people say, but sometimes he won't. Or sometimes he doesn't. Or sometimes it's not his will. But what's he say? I will, I will, I will. Is this the good shepherd talking? <laughs> I will, I will, I will. What do you have to do? What do I have to do? We've got to follow him, don't we? We've got to follow him fully. Now, one more place, Isaiah 40, and then we'll be done today. I don't have, I, I've given up. I don't have enough time to, to, do, to do. So we're just going to pick this and then we'll, we'll stop here and, and we'll pick it up. The Lord's, I was going to maybe do this on Wednesday night a while back, start doing this, but the Lord really quickened me and said, don't do that because that, this is for, right now this is for Sunday mornings. You need to do some more on Sunday mornings with this. So now he might change that going forward, but um, I felt like this was, so we've, this, I've held some of this for a few weeks because I knew the Lord wanted to, to look at it. Um, Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Is the Lord helping you this morning? I'm going to keep reading the end of this, Ezekiel 34. In verse 25, he said, I will make them a covenant of peace. Well, this is interesting. The God of peace is now making a covenant of peace. And he said, I will cause the evil beast of the field to cease out of the land, and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. Is that protection? God's saying a beast is not going to eat you up. Now, that doesn't mean much to you and, day, you and me today because when we go to the zoo, there's something between you and the lion. But if you're sleeping out there with the lions in their house, <laughs> then this, this would mean something to you. You're not going to get eaten by one. He said, I will make them a blessing and the places round about my hill a blessing. I will cause a shower to come down in a season and there will be showers of blessing. Is this provision and prosperity? Good news. He says, and the tree, of the, field shall, the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bands of their yoke. Is this the good shepherd? Yes. He wants you free. <laughs> and delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. Are you, are you seeing the connection between no fear and God's going to take care of me? He's going to sustain me. And we see protection and prosperity. He said in verse 30, They shall know that the Lord their God, I am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, says the Lord, and you, my flock, and the flock of my pasture. Whose flock are you? Man, we, we're set for life, aren't we? That, that's, a, that's a set for life verse that I'm the Lord's sheep, and he's going to take care of me. But what's my part? i got to follow him. i got to follow him if I want him to take care of me. Now, Isaiah 40, and then that, that'll be enough for today. Isaiah 40. Thank you, Lord. Come on, would God lead you into that kind of life? Would he lead you into stuff and bring you out of stuff? He would. But you and I, we just got we got to follow him. Do what he shows us to do. And if it's small, what should you do? There was a time, this, this is big, this is a big example of this. The Lord told me, I think two years ago now, it was actually on Amber's birthday, it was in a service, I think it was a Sunday morning service, and the Lord told me, he said, I want you to start spending a lot of time praying in other tongues. And I didn't know why. Should I go, why, Lord? Well, tell me why, and then I'll do it. I don't think so. <laughs> um, but he told me that, so I, I started doing that. I started spending a lot of time praying in tongues. And I didn't know at the time, but he was setting me up for a trip that I was going to take with him, a prayer trip to go pray. And I was going to pray in a lot in tongues during that time. And there was things he wanted to say to me that I needed to be ready and, and prayed up and know some things, some more things about praying in the spirit that, that he showed me. And he was preparing me for this time. And then when I got with him in that time, he gave me a mandate for my life. It's, it's, one of the, it's the thing that's going to, that drives our ministry. And, and it's it big. It's, li it's a life-changing thing. Now, what if I hadn't listened in church that day? 
See, my, my point is, it doesn't matter if it doesn't seem like a big deal or it's small. If you want to make it all the way, you need to follow Him fully and just do what He said. So I started praying in the Spirit. Well, then when I got there to pray, this was eight, nine months later, when I went away with Him to pray, I was, I was much more developed in praying in other tongues, knew some things. He had taught me some things about it. So I got there, and, and I was there for two or three days, and I was able to just to jump right in to it. And, and, and now I'm hearing, and He's talking to me, and He, and he, and he showed me, He said, this is the mandate on your life. This is what you're going to do. And it's big. And it's great. It's awesome. It, you know, anything the Lord gives you a mandate, it's going to be good. And it was good. But had I not done all that, maybe I wouldn't have heard. You know, or maybe I still wouldn't know. But now I know. And, and, and that's why you need to do those little things he shows you to do. Are you, are you doing okay this morning? Let's look at Isaiah 40 and then that'll be good. Does anybody know what time I started? I think about an hour ago. Never mind. Don't even look. Don't even. I don't even want to know. I don't even want to know. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Come on, do you have a good shepherd? Yes. But part of making it all the way is you have to follow him. And, and I, would, I would say in the room right now, there's people in the room that would say, you know what, the Lord's been dealing with me. And you would say, he's been dealing with me to do this. He's been dealing with me to do that. He's been dealing with me on this. Come on, anybody just, you know, testify by a nodding of the head or raising the hand. Yeah, there's some things I could locate that say, the Lord's been kind of dealing with me to do this. And I haven't done it. You know what we need to do? We need to go ahead and do it and be obedient and follow him. And if you don't understand, you need to do it. And if you do understand, you need to do it. And if it's going to make you uncomfortable, you need, you need to do it. And if it's going to be inconvenient, you need to go ahead and do it. And if it's, you're going to go to a place that you don't really want to go, you need to go ahead and go. And you need to do what the Lord's showing you to do, don't you? Because if you want to make it all the way, it's connected to this ministry of the Good Shepherd. And your part of that ministry is to follow him so that he can take care of you the way he wants to take care of you. And, and this answers a lot of questions. Well, you know, and, and, and I don't want to get too much into this, but well, why did this happen to me? Or why did that happen to me? And so many times we pretend like we don't know. Well, maybe you didn't follow. Maybe the Lord was trying to keep it from happening. You know, I mean, why did that happen? I, you ever hear people say this? Everything happens for a reason. You ever hear that? Yeah, and sometimes the reason it happened, dummy, is because you didn't follow. You know, I mean, that's what you want to say. Did I say that out loud? I probably shouldn't have said that when I was preaching. But, you know, th that's sometimes the reason that that happened to you is because God was dealing with you and you didn't follow him. Right. And it wasn't a grand idea of his, this magical, mystical plan he has for you to have this happen to you. It was just because you didn't listen. And the reality is there's a lot of stuff that happens to people that's not God's plan at all. And it happens because they didn't follow. Now, he's merciful, and if you repent and get back, he'll help you and get you delivered. But how many would like to not fall in in the first place? <laughs> yes, huh? And, and get delivered in the first place. But you, you and I, you know, we need to follow him. And uh, I, I want to read you this verse here, and then that, that'll be good. I'm going to read this to you out of the easy to read, and this will be a good way to close this today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to make it. All the way. How about you? Huh? I'm going to make it all the way. And my kids are going to make it all the way. Huh? And your kids are going to make it all the way. And, 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 and you and I, we're going to be supplied for. We're going to be provided for. We're going to, we're going to eat. We're going to be furnished with provision. We're going to be protected. Come on, we're going to run our race, finish our course, keep our faith, right? And run, and, and run the whole race and make it all the way and die with some white hair or some no hair or, you know, at an old age, right? And, be, and, and there's, there's a scripture in Job that talked about when you go that you're going to be like a shock of corn in its season. And what it means is you're not going to go tired. You're not going to go weak. You're not going to go sick. You're not going to go poor. You're not going to go down, huh? Could you go strong? Yeah. We, we need mind renewal. People think, well, I got to die when I'm tired and old and weak. No, you could be energetic, full and strong and just go, I'm out of here, yep. right? And that's really how you're supposed to go. That's, I say, that's the best way to go. That's how God wants everybody to go, right? And, you, and you're still here, so you can still go that way, right? Somebody said, well, I know somebody that didn't go that way, and they're in heaven. Um, don't cry too much for them. They're having a fine time up there. <laughs> and you'll see them in just a little bit anyway. And, and you'll, you know, that God's got all that taken care of. Um, but you and I can make it all the way. You know, and this church is going to make it all the way. Because yes, huh? this church has an assignment. And it has an, a, des a destiny. And God has a plan for it. And it's not going to die out and finish early. Amen. Huh? It's going to thrive into the next season. It's going to prosper. And we're going to have success. And we're going to keep reaching people. And even more people. And have a greater impact here in this community. Come on, do you believe it? 
and God's going to send some new people and some new resources and, and some new finances and some new things are going to happen. And he's going to do a, a new thing here and it's going to be a great thing. Yeah. And it's not going to fizzle out or just die out. He's going to do a mighty work. We're going to make it all the way. Yes, We're going to make it all the way. Huh? And your grandkids huh, are going to make it all the way. Yes, all the way. Praying. All the way. Yes. You can trust the Lord with it. But you need to start saying this in your prayer time. You need to start decreeing that over them. They're going to make it all the way. Huh? I don't understand what they're doing now. They might be drunk, looking high. I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever. They're going to make it all the way. Amen. You and I are supposed to call things that be not as though they are, right? Amen. So when it looks like they're not going to make it, what should you say? Oh, they're going to make it. God's hand is on them. His spirit's working in them. God will send somebody across their path they like, that they can't say no to, and they'll preach the word to them. You know, God knows who you like. Huh? He knows who to use. <laughs> And he could send a preacher across their path that they don't like any preachers, but that one, there's something about that one that they like. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to read this verse. Should we even read it? I don't think so. We're at a good place. Just stand to your feet with me today. Thank you, Lord. That's a first. I don't know if I've ever quit in the middle of a verse. You just witnessed a miracle. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Let's let the word, the Lord seal this in our hearts today. Can we do that? Thank you, Lord. You know, what it told us in Isaiah is it told us that the one that measured the earth and the water of the earth and the heavens in the span of his hand, that is the one who's sustaining you and me. That's the one who wants to take care of you and me. Our good shepherd. And I want to encourage you today. No matter what you're in, no matter what you're facing, there's nothing that the Lord, that the good shepherd can't help you with. There's nothing that you're so deep in that he can't get you out of. There's, there's not a situation that's so dark that he can't shine the light and set you free. And the enemy will work to try to get you to feel hopeless and feel helpless. Now, what's always going to be this way? And the Lord's saying to you today that's not always going to be this way. That the good shepherd, that if you'd acknowledge him and follow him, that he could deliver you out of the deepest pit. He could set you free in your darkest hour. He could lead you on a path of righteousness and prosperity for His name's sake. Provide for you, protect you, take care of your kids, take care of your family, take care of your finances. People, people listening online, maybe in the building today, you're struggling financially. The Lord's been dealing with you about this. He dealt with you a bunch of times today. He's telling you, I can get you out of this. If you'll follow me, I can lead you into a green pasture. I can lead you into a prosperous place. And if you and I will follow him fully, we will make it all the way. We will run our race and keep our course. Fin finish the race. Do all that he's called us to do and walk in all that he's called us to walk in. It's right there and it's available for you, me, and it's so easy. It's as easy as as doing what the master has told us to do. When he deals with your heart, yield to it. When he tells you to do something, do it. And the God of peace will sustain you and keep you all your days. Father, we thank you for it today. We release our faith in you. And Lord, we ask, we're asking you today, these areas that maybe we've pushed aside, things that we've set aside that we're not you know, don't want to do or haven't wanted to follow you, Lord, bring those areas back up to us again if we don't know them. And if we do know them, we're taking the opportunity right now to repent and to declare in faith that we're going to make a change. We're going to follow you in the areas we hadn't been following you. We're going to do what you've been telling us to do, do what you've been dealing with our hearts to do. And we thank you for the grace and the help to do it. Let's say this as we go. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that you are the God of peace, that you want to sustain me, take care of me in every way, all my days. I acknowledge you and yield to you as my good shepherd. I declare in faith that I will follow you. I'll follow you fully. I'll obey you, submit to you, and do what you tell me to do. And I thank you that for leading me into green pastures, besides still waters, taking me into 
my prosperous place, my best place. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Lord.